Thank you so much for being here today. Um, really looking forward to this opportunity to dialogue uh, uh, with you as well, because we'll uh, be entertaining some questions at the end. Um, I just wanted to share uh, at the very beginning here that um, very often in times of trouble, uh, I go back to the words of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, probably her most profound speech that means so much to me, um, uh, uh, the solitude of self. Uh, it's just amazing, amazingly profound words. Um, and so by the grace of Dr. Gruby and by her talent and by her research, we have the opportunity today to actually dialogue with Elizabeth Cady Stanton directly. What an incredible opportunity. And I would just like to ask you to join me in a warm welcome for the woman to whom we owe so much, um, truly the, the foremother of women's rights, of human rights. Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Thank you so much for joining us. It's an incredible honor to spend time with you. I'm very happy to be here. Oh. I actually um, recently have been thinking about you, um, consulting your words, um, kind of troubled by um, what I have ahead of me in the next couple of months, which is to um, step into a role of leadership that um, previously has been held by a couple of individuals um, that are just extraordinary. Um, I'm a member of um, the executive committee of what's called the Conference of Mayors. And uh, it's a statewide organization that lobbies on behalf of mayors uh, of cities and villages across the state and uh, provides counsel and, and guidance to uh, communities. And um, as a member of the executive committee, um, I'll be moving into the, the role of president of that organization. And uh, so I've been thinking about the fact that, um, you know, I'll, I'll be um, uh, sworn in mm -hmm. in, uh, in May. And uh, as I said, the, the my predecessors are really exceptionally extraordinary people. Um, my immediate predecessors, one of them um, actually created a community um, in order to solve problems where he lived, stepped into a role of leadership and, and uh, created a new community. Um, the mayor of Jamestown, the, the immediate president, the current president, um, leader of a, uh, a large uh, community, a large city actually, um, Again, a very well-known individual across the state, very politically involved. These are people that I would term as extraordinary. And um, my inclination in May is to stand and say, I represent the ordinary. And uh, I've always believed that ordinary people um, can lead. It doesn't take an, any innate uh, skill or innate talent to lead. All it takes is a desire to make a difference. And today we have the opportunity to, to actually ask you, what was your inspiration to, to lead and to actually, in my opinion, become one of the greatest minds of, of your time? Misery. Misery. <laughs> Misery. Being ordinary was my inspiration. I had grown up with privilege, um, with servants, with um, an excellent education. I had had an opportunity to travel to London with my husband, who was a, a notable abolitionist. I was already known, even in my 20s, as someone in connection to um, my husband, and certainly as a child, as an adolescent, to my father, Judge Cady. I was well protected, and then I moved to Seneca Falls. Okay. And I lived on a road that was covered in mud, and my children had malaria which in those days using homeopathy took three months to treat. I couldn't get good servants. I had to do things on my own. I was tired. I was frustrated. And I looked around me and I saw that other women who I had never noticed before were also tired and frustrated and weary with the world. And I decided that I was tired of that. I was tired of the endlessness of that monotonous life of housekeeping. And when I started housekeeping, it was a novelty to me. And I, I took great joy in being the mistress of my home and of having a well-run 
home within those four walls, I was the queen. And in Seneca Falls, I couldn't keep things going. And I knew for the first time in my life how it was possible for a woman to actually sit down in the midst of chaos to take a rest. And so when my good friend and my mentor, how much I owe her, Lucretia Mott came to visit her sister, Martha Coffin Wright, and I was invited, I just poured out all of my frustrations and I stirred them and I stirred myself and, and we decided that we would call a convention. We had talked about it eight years before, but it had never come to fruition because I had been comfortable and I stopped being comfortable. And I began to realize what it was like for ordinary people to live without their rights. And I decided to make an end to that. Wow. Wow. Um, do you, did you aspire as a child to, to attain a position of leadership? Or did you um, have hopes that you, would, uh, that you would be regarded as a leader? Well, it's a well-known story now, I suppose. I, um, I decided I was going to cut out all of the laws in my father's law books that pertain to the degradation of women. And he found out about my plan before I had an opportunity to do it. And he explained to me that what I had to do when I grew up was go to Albany and talk to the men there. And so I decided that is indeed what I would do. And so from that point on, I always had in my mind that I was going to do something. And I worked very, very hard to be everything to my father that a boy would have been had my brothers lived. And uh, unfortunately, my father was never satisfied with my efforts because although he always said, I wish you had been a boy, I never could be a boy. But I learned everything that a boy learns. I studied Greek and I studied Latin. I studied how to ride a horse properly and I could, I could outdo the boys in math and I could outdo them in running. And uh, I always had in my mind that someday I would do something. I didn't know what until I was older. So would you think that your father is, is the source of your inspiration then? My father was a remarkable person conservative, dignified, principled, and I looked up to him. I wanted no one's approval more than his. My mother was a queenly woman, um, mistress of her domain. Uh, later in her life, she became a suffragist. I owe a great deal to her. Mrs. Mott was the other person I admired the very most. Mrs. Mott is the person who took me beyond <sighs> the thraldom of my religion and made me open my eyes to the possibility that women are the equals of men not only in their abilities and intellect as my father was beginning to teach me before he pulled back a little bit but um, in religion before God she told me to doubt everything and she exposed me to the writings of Mary Wollstonecraft and she was the first woman I ever met who was completely confident in her own abilities and was willing to stand up. And uh, I remember her saying that uh, we must be willing to incur ridicule if it's what the times demand of us. I never forgot that. Those are powerful, powerful words. I think um, in my experience, uh, that probably is um, one uh, thread that may be consistent and continuous through um, through people who are in positions of leadership. Um, you have to become thick-skinned and endure um, a lot of uh, uh, ridicule, a lot of mockery, I think, in order to uh, um, to be able to survive in that arena. You have to be able to laugh. <laughs> you have to be able to laugh. I was um, not successful in anything I did. Very few things Surprising. that I did. <laughs> now, you know, people today might look at me and think that I accomplished a great deal. And maybe it's true, but I was sowing winter wheat. And so today, you are the ones who are reaping the harvest. But when I was alive, all I had around me was failure and ridicule. People mocked me. People disassociated themselves from me, condemned me in the press. Uh, there were... There were fashionable ladies, and I had been a fashionable lady, 
There were fashionable ladies who said that they couldn't tolerate the idea of seeing my name in the paper and how humiliating that must be for me. Mm. And I pointed out to them, well, you are in the papers too, in the society pages. And the difference between us is that, is that fools mock and ridicule me and wise men m mock and ridicule you. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, I failed at many things, and you have to be willing to fail at many things if you know that what you're standing for is right. And to be willing to stand up alone, even against your friends, is very important. My friends turned their backs on me. My colleagues, my mentors, my parents turned their back on me. But I knew that what I was doing was right, and it was worth standing up for that, even in the midst of that. Sometimes it was anguish, and I cried uh, bitter tears over those times. But um, if I could give one bit of advice, I always said this, if I could give one bit of advice to people who are trying to make a difference, is try everything and anything, no matter what, to make sure that people hear what you have to say. If they mock you, that's fine. Eventually, if they talk about it, as soon as people begin talking about it, then eventually, if your cause is true and just, you will win. I've often wondered how, you know, at a time when uh, you had very few resources for, for spreading the word. Mm. I mean, today we have the internet, we have radio, we have television, we have all of these incredible resources to, um, to um, you know, disseminate information. And I've marveled time and again at how effective uh, you were at, at spreading uh, such a critical message and in such an impactful way. Um, that's, it's just a, a, a source of admiration for, for many. Well, there was no magic in it. Um, there was a, a large community of abolitionists, and many of whom were Quakers, many of whom were progressive friends. And they had a well-organized social network. Uh, between them, between Rochester and Syracuse and central New York, uh, around Seneca Falls. And they were very used to working together and networking with each other. And they uh, would send letters and they would visit one another. And so when we decided to have our convention, the first people who decided to come were friends. Now at that time, many of the friends were experimenting with the spirits. Mm. And so they were already quite a bit of excitement over that. But we just uh, knew who our allies already were, and we knew how to talk to one another and to give each other courage and strength. Remember, too, that many of us were already engaged in these networks because we were, we were fighting slavery. And we had to know who our allies were because that was very dangerous work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Knowing wow. who your friends are is very important. I draw a lot of energy from uh, um you know, my friends from those people that I choose to spend time with. Um, and uh, so I understand, I understand what you're saying. Um, you know, not just uh, choosing to spend time with allies, if you will, mm -hmm. but people who um, challenge me to, to think and uh, challenge my, uh, my uh, philosophies, if you will, um, because mm -hmm. that's such an opportunity to, to learn. Who challenged you, do you, do you think? Many people. Frederick Douglass challenged me. That was probably one of the one of the one of the periods of my life of which I'm most ashamed was following following the Civil War, my anger at not getting the vote for women. And having been so sure, even though dear Susan, Susan B. Anthony told me that I should not expect it, I was so sure that we would get the vote. When we did not, I turned against old allies. And I used language that many considered to be racially inflammatory and hurtful. And my old ally, uh, Frederick Douglass, who had been there for me at the beginning in 1848, was deeply hurt by my words, as were many other of the abolitionists. And that was part of the reason why the women's rights movement split in that time period was over that great tension that many of us felt uh, surrounding the issue of whether or not black men or white women should have the right to vote. And in the beginning, before we became very, very angry, 
many of us, including Sojourner Truth, said that who we are, were forgetting were black women. But eventually the conversation became bitter and angry, and I regret that. But your, your speech, uh, the, the solitude itself, uh, that, your message is so clear that you believe in the individual uh, worth of every, every human being. Um, mm. you, you make it so clear that women should not be regarded differently, that no one should be regarded differently. I, I think of it more as a, a piece on human rights uh, than just women's rights. In the end, we all stand alone. And each of us has to move forward through life. And we may think that we have assistance and that we can lean on our friends. Women may want to lean on their husbands and their fathers. And men may want us to do that. But in the end, we all are in life alone. And so it is, it is cruel to deprive any human being of all the tools they can possibly have to make that journey easier. The most important of those tools would be education. Yeah, yeah, I understand. And, um, but I think it's probably, that argument is probably one of the most powerful arguments for, for women's rights that I've ever heard. It's, it's not on, uh, you know, on the basis of the legality or the illegality of you know, the treatment of women, um, but rather that um, each individual um, you know, does, does stand alone and therefore shouldn't be deprived of, of the tools. But the other piece of that that was so remarkable to me is also the recognition that by denying the tools, um, you're denying an individual the ability to, to contribute and to make a difference. So I thought that was, um, you know, really, uh, um, you know, the, the positive side of the argument. Well, I think that it is really critical to understand that every individual, because they are so unique, irreplaceable, each of us has something to contribute. And when we get in the way of someone else's contributions, then we're standing in the way of, potentially, of greatness, and certainly of their helpfulness. The old argument was that women should be part of politics because we are morally superior. Hmm. That's just stuff and nonsense. Women are not morally superior. We are ontologically the same as men. We are good and bad. We fail and we succeed. What we need are the tools to allow us to become what we are meant to be. But in my time, the argument continued with so many people, including so many suffragists, that the reason we had to vote was because we were morally superior. And that means women would serve their children, serve their families, and they were living as if they were living for another. And you have to live for yourself. It is critical that every human being be given the dignity of living for him or herself. Do you think that that was some of the source of your shift in terms of your religious uh, views? As a child, I grew up with a, a very angry God, and I, I lived in terror. Um, I can remember being in the nursery, being terrified that I could not feel sorry enough for my sins. I was never sorry enough for my sins. <laughs> and I imagined the devil in the corner. And when Charles Grandis and Finney came through, I was terrified again. And I asked my father to pray for me. Until finally he said, we need to take you someplace on a trip. And he took me on a trip, and then he and my, and my brother-in-law gave me much information about science and rationalism. That was the beginning of the turn. When I began to trust that reason is more powerful than fear. And then when I met Mrs. Mott, I learned also that reason is also something that belongs intrinsically to women. And then I made the final turn. And from that point on, I was a free thinker. And I was not going to take anybody's, no man's, no church's, no priest's word as more important than my own ability to experience, to be reasonable, and to be rational. And from that, I based all of my religious belief. And no doubt you suffered um you know, mockery is probably an understatement, um, you know, when you begin to publish some of those views. The younger women in the movement were very clear that they wanted no more association with me. The movement had become far more conservative, particularly socially conservative. 
They believed that the suffrage was a single panacea and that that would solve all of our problems. I was more concerned about the continuation of laws that degraded women in the family and degraded women in their most intimate relationships as mothers, as wives. And I believed that the source of those laws, the source of the belief that women were to live for another and not for themselves was in the Bible. Hmm. And the women, the young women who were taking over the movement were concerned that my beliefs would alienate many of the women, particularly wealthy women, who believed otherwise and wanted to believe that it was more just to ask for the vote if, if it was a benefit to the cult of motherhood. And uh, I was so frustrated with these women so many times. I, uh, at one point, Susan B. Anthony and I tried to get a group of school teachers in New York State uh, to side with us in our attempt to get them higher wages. We thought they should earn as much as men who were teachers. And they stood against us. And I thought, what a bunch of fools these women are. And I said to her that if they were content in an effort to please men to live on air, let them, because the sooner that generation died off, the better. There were jackasses enough in the world without these kinds of women <laughs> propagating more. Harsh words. <laughs> Harsh words. Um, what do you think, uh, in, in your recollections, what, is, what would be your shining moment? Hmm. The Seneca Falls Convention was one of them. The Married Woman's Property Act was another. The birth of my children. I loved being a mother. And I was very proud of all of them. And when my daughter Margaret was born, and later when Hattie was born, I knew that this was the next generation. And the birth of my daughters continued to inspire me because I knew that despite the ridicule, I could continue for their sake. And I knew that when it was their turn, they would do the same for the next generation. Are you satisfied with uh, uh, how they may have carried your message forward and, uh, and how, in, in fact, generations uh, hence have carried your message forward? I was very proud of my daughters. I was proud of all of my children. Margaret was involved. Harriet was even more involved. And she eventually became even more radical, I think, than I was. I was surprised, too, that my son Theodore took up the cause. And that's an important lesson to remember, too. He listened to everything his mother said. And I am very proud of their efforts. I also saw and was disappointed by many in their generation and their willingness to concede to many points. I felt that the, the point we needed to attack most firmly was the relationship of women to their husbands and the idea of women as mothers. I knew that would go, was going to be the battleground that would be hardest to win. And I knew that men would defend that point most uh, ferociously, and I was true. And I see in your own issues today that often is the problem. It's often about matters of what makes a good mother. And this is often where women are trapped. So I am disappointed about that. It sounds like you would, you would say that one of the most powerful roles then that we play uh, as women are teachers and mothers. Yes, but there are many different ways to mother. And I believe that it's very important that women mother only if they choose to and when they plan to. That was very, very important to me then, and it's important to me now. And I believe that it's important that women not define themselves as mothers. Define yourself as yourself. Your relationships with your children will change, and sometimes they will end. But you must be yourself through and through to the very end of your life. That is the one relationship you, you cannot betray. Those are profound words. Well, thank you. On behalf of everyone here, what an incredible opportunity this has been, and uh, we hope to be able to do it again. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you. And now I'm going to 
invite Elizabeth to come, out and come up and read the rededication to you, and then invite you to come and sign the book on your <coughs> to your next location. To here. To commemorate and honor the 160th anniversary, not now anymore, what is it? 163. 163rd anniversary of the presentation of the Declaration of Sentiments at the first Women's Rights Convention held in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. We recognize the timeless significance of this world-changing document, its principles ever present, its meaning ever contemporary, its message of hope ever inspirational, its vision of humanity ever virtuous and his call to action ever vital. We therefore rededicate the Declaration of Sentiments and dedicate ourselves to its fundamental spirit and moral principles, ensuring it be carried forth as a social contract for our nation and our world. As it was done 163 years ago and firmly relying upon the final triumph of the right and the true, we do this day affix our signatures to this declaration. Thank you. Won't you come inside? Just go form a line. I've labeled the page March 8th, the 100th anniversary of the International Women's Day. So, you write your name, very first. Thank you. Thank you for coming today.